everyone, and welcome to another episode of EM Case's Best Case Ever mini podcast series. I'm your host, Dr. Rajiv Thevanathan. My guest today is Dr. Joe Namath. He's a staff eMERGE physician who spent most of his career at Montreal General and Montreal Children's Hospital. He's an associate professor in emergency medicine at both McGill and University of Toronto. He was one of the pioneers of the Trauma Team Leader Program at Montreal General, where he's currently still the director of the TTL Fellowship, and yes, he still does call as a TTL himself. Joe, welcome to the show. Hey, Rajiv. Nice to be here. Thanks for inviting me. Joe, tell me about your best case ever. Yeah, as early on in my career at uh, Janus, we had just began the TTL program, and ED physicians back then were thought of as technicians only, and I'm saying that in jest. Uh, there were still definitely colleagues that, that respected us, but... Clearly, when it came to trauma, we were still thought of as amateurs. So basically, um, it was a classic Saturday night, a couple of drunks, you know, the usual stuff. Our shop is an inner city hospital that sees a lot of, uh, lot of goodies. And uh, at 2 a.m., we get the classic 2 a.m. call that EMS is en route with a 17-year-old who was stabbed in the box at the scene. He was diaphoretic, talking with a BP of 80. But as they were talking to me, I hear some shouting in the background and he had lost his vitals. So basically like the nightmare patch. Now, tell our listeners what you mean by the box. Yeah, so it's a penetrating trauma from an instrument and it is the anterior chest bounded by the clavicles, the nipples and the costochondral margins. Right, so what we sort of colloquially call the cardiac box or getting stabbed that's in the box. Correct. Right? That's correct. Right, right, right. That's correct. Okay, so the guy, you know, you only have like a minute to get ready. He rolls in and what's going on? We had a minute. So I'd like to say we prepared the room, we prepared the team, and we pre- I prepared myself. We had a minute for that. So that was rather quick, but it was enough. I always like to stand outside of the trauma bay to see uh, when the EMS arrives. It gives me an idea of are they rolling in with a patient and scratching their rear end or are they like the driver hops out of the car and does, you know, his Flash Gordon imitation to open the back and all that. So it gives me an idea. And of course, I saw that the CPR was ongoing. So I quickly rushed back into the trauma bay and told the team that this is the real thing. And there it is. They, they rolled him in. So walk us through the initial resuscitation. Yeah. So we extolled the importance of CBA instead of ABC in the context of traumatic arrest. So we were hunting for blood and reversible causes of death, meaning tension, hemoneumothoraces, tamponade, and extenuation. The patient was easily bagged by the EMS personnel, and then that was taken over by our RT. She had mentioned that the, the bagging was fine, and so at that point, and the airway is patent, at that point I didn't feel the need to rush into a crash airway. There were more important matters to address. And when you say more important matters to address, is something specific or? Yeah, so what the, the roles were, how they were assigned is that we'll have to relieve any potential tension hemoneumothoraces. So uh, there was a physician, a resident uh, uh, next to the patient on each side with a scalpel and made a hole into the chest wall on both sides with a finger in and very briefly looked for any results from that. And there was none. And at the same time, All was happening in parallel. I had somebody who was very adept in POCUS take a look at the pericardium and the precordial view of the heart showed very full pericardium with obvious tamponade. Okay, wow. So I think we all know where this is going. You know, you get uh, what's the next step? Well, we decided to give epinephrine and start pushing on the chest. No, no. So hold that, hold that, hold that. But, but, but keep that in mind for those of you that are sold on pushing on the chest. How ludicrous it would have been to have done that. So what we did was we sort of prepared ourselves for this kind of scenario. We ended up undergoing a left-sided ED thoracotomy, quickly exposing the pericardium, excising it, and then evacuating the, uh, the blood. It was a blood clot, by the way, which also uh, speaks to the fact that a pericardiocentesis would likely not have been uh, successful. As soon as the clot was evacuated, the patient uh, actually um, started perfusing, but so much so that started perfusing his brain and woke up in the middle of the procedure. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and he's like, excuse me, uh, do you mind? I'm, I'm <laughs> trying, to, trying to breathe here. Yeah. So well, how do you manage that? Yeah, so quickly, we had IV access already, and we quickly gave him the uh, special K treatment and then, and then ended up getting definitive airway control. And just like pray that he doesn't remember it. And, and subsequently, just so you know, there's a, definitely a happy ending. Uh, he did not remember. Well, thank heaven for that. Did he survive? Yeah, so the patient ended up having like a half an inch right ventricular 
laceration, which I, I put my finger on. By that time, the trauma surgeon had arrived. Uh, it was decided that the patient is best served if we bring him up to the OR because we were able to achieve hemostasis with my finger. The patient was brought up to the OR, and one week later, the patient went home with an IQ of 120. Wow, that's incredible. An IQ of 120, is that better or worse than when you came in? Actually, it's better. He got smarter. Better. He learned a lot. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, but seriously, for how dramatic that case is, you must have had some great learning points from that. Tell me, what did you take away from it? So my take-home messages are, number one, any rare procedure that we might do in the emergency department, being rare as it is, you need to be prepared. And when you are prepared and you own it, you can't be afraid to pull the trigger and perform that procedure, number one. Number two, the toughest part of opening a chest is pulling the trigger, and we'll talk about that as well. And number three, probably most important, is we have to rethink traumatic cardiac arrest. This ain't no ACLS arrest. And that's awesome. And I want to explore the nuances of traumatic cardiac arrest with you in a second. You've mentioned a few times already the importance of preparation for a critically ill trauma. How do you personally prepare for a big recess in general? Like, how do you get everyone on the same page in advance of the patient arriving? Rajiv, this is a question that I think merits its own uh, hour. But briefly, we had one minute. And in that one minute... How I like to say is we like to prepare the room, prepare the team, and prepare yourself. And by preparing the room very briefly, what I mean is making sure the, uh, the stretcher that we're going to be using the patient on is prepared appropriately. And what I mean by that is, is making sure the proper equipment is around the patient, meaning chest tubes, open chest trays, ultrasound, airway equipment. And also, I'd like to bring in another aspect to preparing the stretcher, a so-called cruciform positioning. Basically, what that means is what we're trying to start here at uh, Janus is preparing the patient as soon as he's unloaded onto our stretcher to put him in a what's called this cruciform position, basically akin to how a patient is draped and prepped in the OR. Arms abducted to 90 degrees where there's access for the nurses to the arms for IVs and the physicians have access to the torso for procedures. So we had prepared the room as such. Then we prepared the team in the following manner by talking about the potential scenarios. This was actually fairly easy. Stab, penetrating trauma to the box in arrest. So we prepared the team as to what the next uh, steps should be or the initial steps should be in the context of the patient arriving, which we can dwell into a bit later. And then I prepared myself. And that is uh, something where I just go through everything in my mind as to how I want this to run and take a couple of deep breaths. And that was the preparation. And how do you find that preparation helps in the first few minutes of a resuscitation of a sick trauma patient? So basically, we have enough uh, people on, on board and to help out. So everybody had a role, one person on each side of the chest for a finger into the chest. And then one person who you trust is a good ultrasonographer with the probe over the uh, the chest wall to look for cardiac activity and badness in the pericardium. Yeah, that makes a ton of sense. You know, while we're on it, where do you see POCUS fitting in for traumatic cardiac arrest? You know, I just finished my POCUS fellowship here in Ottawa. I have some thoughts on it. I'm curious, the TTL that's been doing this for a long time, if someone arrives in arrest from penetrating trauma to the chest, what do you think are the questions that POCUS needs to answer right away? Is it is the list as long as it is in like a, a sick blunt trauma? Or is it now that they're penetrating chest arrest, are the questions pretty focused? You know, I might simplify things, Rajiv, but I think they're one and the same. I think uh, you're hunting for blood and you're hunting for reversible causes of death. And in fact, I tell my team that they are not allowed having a stethoscope around their neck. And so I think that tells you what I think of the stethoscope and what I think of the importance of uh, ultrasound. It's really one question. Is the patient's pericardium need to be uh, opened? And that's sort of what the the question is. After that, you can go down to do a formal fast. If the pericardium is clean and this is, you know, and this is a penetrating trauma, you're looking for blood, do you then make a case for cross-clamping the aorta and so on and so forth? But clearly, whether it's blunt or penetrating, I cannot stress it enough, Rajiv, you cannot uh, take care of a patient in the 21st century without ultrasound at the bedside. Yeah, you're definitely preaching to the choir here. I do think traumatic cardiac arrest from a penetrating chest wound 
is a little different than our standard eFAST exam. Now, this is just my opinion, but I'd advocate that the ultrasound findings of, say, free fluid in the abdomen can definitely wait. And although hemothorax and pneumothorax are obviously clinically important to diagnose, if the patient is in arrest, you'll be doing bilateral finger thoracostomies as a first step in your recess anyway. So that takes those entities off the table as reversible causes. I think the real money is on the pericardial view with the ultrasound for two reasons. One, it informs about the presence of hemopericardium and tamponade, which is, in the right hands, also reversible, but also the presence or absence of cardiac activity, which can be prognostically useful. There was a paper done by the folks at LA County back in 2015 that showed a 0% survival for patients with traumatic cardiac arrest, and that's blunt and penetrating, if there was no pericardial effusion and no organized cardiac motion. So if you're like me and you're working in a center where doing an ED thoracotomy is a relatively rare procedure, this can definitely spare the patient a morbid intervention that is not going to help to say nothing of the safety of your team and the strain on the resources of your hospital. And on that note, Joe, speaking of hospital resources, you and I get to work in a hospital where there's going to be at least, you know, two or three MDs around a patient. Imagine you were working in a community center or a single coverage hospital, uh, you know, that isn't a trauma center. How do you think you would prioritize the tasks for the patient? I think a lot of our listeners work in uh, different sort of uh, settings. If you were a single MD with maybe two nurses and you got someone that had been stabbed in arrest, do you have a, a protocol already in your mind or is it sort of a case by case basis? Thank God I've never been in that kind of situation. I, I've worked at a, you know many community hospitals, including Brampton, if you can call it a community hospital, but we're always fortunate to have at least double coverage. So there's always another colleague that could help out. However, if you're really alone, I think clearly somebody taking an airway and making sure you don't need a tube in there, but making sure that basic life support as far as the airway and the breathing is supported with uh, back valve mescalation. So somebody can do that, a nurse or an RT. I think when it comes to you making sure that somebody has IV access and that too can be delegated to a nurse. And on your end, if somebody comes in arrest, I think it's the same sort of thing, you know, going for, for what's going to kill. So you have to eliminate tension pneumothoraces, hemothoraces. So that means putting a hole in each chest. And then after that, if there's no ROSC and there's no BP, then uh, with an ultrasound, taking a look at the pericardium and making decisions uh, accordingly. So do you think to summarize that, it would be fair to say if you were a sole provider, maybe try to delegate the, you know, because people, they train with ATLS and the ABCs get hammered into us that A always takes precedence over everything. My editorial would be that traumatic cardiac arrest is a little different in that the A is, unless there's an acute obstruction or problem with the airway, that that might be something that can wait and to take care of sort of the obstructive causes first. So the MD tasks might be delegate A to someone either bag or get a superglottic airway in, make sure someone is getting really big access so you can get that early transfusion started. And then the initial MD tasks are really just like finger on the right side, finger on the left side, and then proceeding to a thoracotomy, you know, if you feel comfortable, if you can get to surgery, surgical backup quickly. And if you see, uh, you know, something on the uh, POCUS that could be addressed or reversed, essentially, does that does that sound fair? I could not have said it better. Now, I do have one final question. During your description of the case, you alluded to stopping CPR and not giving epinephrine or other vasopressors. Could you elaborate on that for the traumatic cardiac yeah. arrest? Yeah, so I'm glad you brought this up, Rajiv, because I think if uh, if somebody just listens to this part of the podcast, I'll be very happy with So traumatic cardiac arrest is, is a different beast, you know? If you think of all the reasons that somebody will arrest from trauma and we start from head to toe, let's apply ACLS principles and sort of CPR pushing on the chest to all of these entities. So let's start with the head. Catastrophic, traumatic brain injury, ACLS and pushing in the chest will not get us back, correct? I would concede and, and that, I'm, yeah, for sure. Yeah, so I'm not gonna, I'm gonna stop asking the rhetorical questions, but I'm just gonna go on. So let's continue on the C-spine. So catastrophic C-spine injuries, ditto. Uh, let's go into the chest. So tension, hemo or pneumothoraces, ditto. Cardiac injury, ditto. Let's go into the abdomen. What about extenuation from a solid organ, ditto. Let's go on to the pelvis, uh, catastrophic massive pelvic injury with, with bleed, ditto. So if you look through all the reasons that somebody's going to die from a trauma, pushing on the chest and giving epinephrine will likely and I'm being very sarcastic now, not get this person back. So then people can say, well, 
is it doing harm? Well, the patient's dead already. Is it doing, doing harm? Well, I would argue that it is because it's you're taking away time and effort and resources from something that you should be doing. On top of that, doing CPR, pushing on the chest when somebody has a scalpel on each side of the chest is potentially a very dangerous thing, as you can imagine. So what I told the team here in this case, and, and at that time, it was this is going back a long time, people were freaking out that we're gonna stop CPR, I told them, listen, this patient's coming in, and I explained to them our rationale very quickly, we're gonna stop CPR and we're gonna do X, Y, Z. And when I explained to the team why we're doing, why we're not doing CPR, traditional CPR, and I explained my rationale, there was buy-in. And I think that's what we need to remember. Yeah, those are awesome points, Joe. The pathophys of a trauma arrest is not the same as a medical or ACLS arrest. It's not usually strictly a pump problem, per se, like an MI. You need to address the reversible causes that you can actually do something about. So the mnemonic I've heard is HOT, H-O-T-T, that's reversing H, hemorrhage. So you get a large bore IV or a cordis right away and give blood as fast as you reasonably can. O is oxygenation, so take your pick, face mask, supraglottic airway or endotracheal tube. And then relieving both tension and tamponade. Those are the two causes of obstructive, like immediate life-threatening shock and trauma. And you can do that by quickly decompressing the chest bilaterally with finger thoracostomies and then entering the pericardium if you need to. I think for some people, the hurdle of telling the team to stop CPR is difficult. That's something I've witnessed in the handful of trauma arrests I've seen. So just to reiterate Joe's point from earlier, to say out loud to your team during the preparation phase, this is the plan. I know it's difficult to do this with a pulseless patient but we're going to stop CPR once this patient is on the bed so we can safely do the life-saving procedures that we need to do. Woof, that was a lot that we went through. So Dr. Joe Namath, thank you so, so much for taking the time to speak with me today. My pleasure. And for the rest of you, thanks again for listening. I'm Dr. Rajiv Thavanathan. Make sure to follow me on Twitter. That's at Rajiv Thava. That's R-A-J-I-V-T-H-A-V-A. And we'll catch you next time on EM Case's Best Case Ever. So until then, keep your stick on the ice. Bye.